in the world going on? That's probably a good theological answer. It was, was it not? Especially very distasteful with all the unclean foods in there. We've mentioned a few of them, camels, elephants, horses, catfish, shrimp, eels, snakes, all kinds of reptiles, anything that doesn't have scales, any fish with no scales, any animal that does not have a cloven hoof, you know, with a single hoof like a horse, or anything that doesn't have a cloven hoof there. Uh, there a, lot of different, a lot of different things that are considered unclean. <laughs> I think you're right about that, Fadine, yeah. All right, Wilma, how you doing? All right, did you get your prayer list? Good, 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 good. We're talking about this big sheet. So standing alone, it doesn't make any sense at all. You, does God ever do things like that to, that you have trouble figuring out all the time? <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to share out loud what it might be, but do you know of things that, that have happened in your life that you can't explain any other way but that it was God? Well, obviously, that's, that's right. But there are thing, little things that happen, big things that happen, and all of them are big things with us. Uh, but you can't explain it any other way but that it's God. It's God that's doing this. And so that's what's happening here. Look at it, verse 17. Peter doubted in himself. <laughs> Anybody got anything else in that expression? Peter doubted in himself. <laughs> the word is, was greatly perplexed. He didn't, he didn't know. He couldn't figure it out. He was perplexed in his mind. He doubted within himself. What in the world? What was you said, Ronnie? What in the world? What, what's going on here? This makes no sense at all. What this vision that he had seen should mean. Now, Again, there are times that, God, that God's timing is incredible. That's three words, incredible, okay? He absolutely is always on time. It just so happened. It just so happened at that time when he had seen the sheet, he had heard the voice of God saying, kill and eat. No, not me, kill and eat. No, sir, three times the sheet went back up. Just at that time, there's a knock on the door, and the men are coming to find Peter. Now, do you really believe that that just happened that way? God's timing is incredible, isn't it? We can all share with each other about how his timing has just been right spot on. Uh, sometimes we get a little bit ahead of God. Sometimes we, uh, we want it done now. We want it done right now. Uh, look at it, verse 17. The men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry at Simon's house and stood before the gate. Now, you have to back up to last week. The men, the men had, which had been sent from Cornelius' house, who or what that is? Review, review for me just a moment about what that's all about. Anybody? Anybody? The men that were in Cornelius' house, they're looking for Simon Peter. They're, wanting, they're, they're looking for him. They have heard that he's down at Simon, another Simon, very common name in Israel, Simon the Tanner. Now that, again, is an abnormality that a Jewish man would be a tanner but somebody has to do it, right? I mean, somebody makes the coats of skins. Uh, God made the coat of skins that Adam and Eve were clothed with. Obviously, a, a lamb or some animal had to die and the skin had to be removed. And yet, that was one, considered one of the dirty jobs. Mike Rowe's dirty jobs, that, he, that television program that he has. One of those things. And, and this is Jewish. This is Jewish, this man here. He, uh, he's, he's in Simon's house, and he's there. Simon Peter has just seen the sheet come down. He has just seen the dirty, all the unclean animals. God has told him to eat it. He says, I'm not going to do it. God says, don't you dare call what I've cleaned unclean. And then a knock on the door, 
and there are some unclean men out there looking for him. You see how God's timing is always incredible. It's always spot on. He's never late. He's always right there. Sometimes he doesn't go by our timetable now, Petunia. There's times he don't go with the way we want it done. But his timing is always incredible. Look at verse 18. They called. The word there means they called out loud. They called. Hey, is Peter in there? Now, indicating this thing wasn't done in secret. This, this, is, this is going to be wide open. This is going to be right out there in the middle, of, in the middle of the whole thing. Asking whether Simon, surnamed Peter, was lodged there. The incredible part about that was it was a tanner's house. It was the house of, a, of an unclean job, a dirty job. They want to, hey, is, a, is that guy in here? In other words, the neighborhood can hear him. He called out loud while Peter is thinking on the vision. I bet that's true. What does this mean? What in the world? While Peter was thinking on the vision, the Spirit said to him, Three men are looking for you. <laughs> Again, the incredible timing of God. Question, how do you know it's the Spirit speaking to you? You can feel the conviction? Okay, now you're talking about salvation. Okay, let, let's talk about that for just a moment. Okay, all right. Not me. How you, you may argue with God, but not me. <laughs> we all do, don't we? But how do you know? Uh, the, the conviction, yes, I, I got you there. Against the Word of God. It's always going to agree with the Word of God. He's never going to lead you to do anything contrary to the Word of God. Now, I used to say it this way. There's two reasons, and I stole these. I mean, I, procure, I, I got these from Clyde and Aramore in one of my seminar classes. Uh, that it always makes good sense. But does it always? There are times that God stretches our faith, don't it? Sometimes God leads us to do something that really probably might not make good sense. When we do it, we say, that made sense. But the time is, sometimes He, he, he checks our faith out. We don't know the big picture. At the time, we, that's right, we don't know the big picture. We have every reason to believe that He does. He's up at the top looking down. He's got the whole picture. And then we are down here in our little corner of the world... And we've got a deal here that we're trying to deal with. We have a sheet in front of us with all these unclean animals. And we have God's voice or some kind of voice saying, kill and eat. In my little corner of the world, that don't make any sense unless I get the big picture. So sometimes, go Ronnie. Sometimes the devil will send another believer. Now how do you know, how, how do you know the difference? That's my point. How do you know the difference? The devil can transport himself into an angel of light, transpose himself into an angel of light. Can he? That feeling? I think, in my mind, it's the Holy Spirit speaking to me. Okay. All right. Joyce? We can have discernment over that. We, we can have discernment over that. We, the Bible gives us a discernment that the world doesn't know anything about. We have that discernment. So it's kind of up to us to be plugged in, is it not? We have to be kind of tuned in because we can easily be misled if we're not where we need to be as far as God is concerned. Uh, anytime you want to jump in, let's, 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 let's hit you. Of course he does. What did he say to Jesus? Since you are the Son of God, why don't you prove it? it? Was there anything wrong with Jesus doing that? No. no? Why didn't he do it? 
because of it came from the devil. It came from Satan. Satan was tempting him. Obviously, it, there's a motive behind it. Uh, you're hungry. He had been 40 days without food, okay? You're hungry, right? Uh, yes, I am hungry. We'll make these stones turn to bread. Nothing wrong with that. Not a thing in this world. Except at that point, Satan was leading Jesus to do something that he wanted him to do, not that Jesus wanted to do. Now, do... There's a turmoil that... That's exactly right. That's why I say it generally makes good sense and it agrees with the Bible. Now, this did not... Because why? There you go. He's cha- this is a transition. Acts is a book of transitions. They're doing several things. Several things here. They're actually seeing Gentile people, not Jews, Gentile people are coming into the faith. (laughs) Peter's the one, remember, Peter has the keys to the kingdom, and he's already been up to Samaria. You know how I feel about the Samaritans. I don't even speak to the Samaritans. They don't have a soul. They can't be saved. And yet Jesus said, go up there and see what's going on in that revival up there. There's been a lot of things that didn't make good sense, kind of, Unless you get the whole picture. You see, go Ronnie. Right. They were leaving to try to bring in God's word. They, I mean, it, God was telling them to do something that was against what God had told them to do before. Before. Yeah. And yet he said, I have cleansed this. Don't call it dirty. Peter was a little slow getting the message here because it had not been publicized out that you can now eat catfish or That's, that is the point. That is the whole point here. But he's using these animals here. Uh, and, and, and the Torah, as I understand it, never once said a Gentile was unclean. No, I, no, I don't remember him saying that. So Peter had that from his traditional training. Right. No, it's not in that. But when God said, what I have cleansed, don't call unclean. By the way, there's three men at the door. And he met the Gentiles and they were That's exactly right. They don't they are not unclean. That's exactly right. But they were considered as unclean. They were to Peter. That's right. That's exactly right. It's one of those things that you have to realize that Peter, this is a transition thing. And there's a lot of things in the book of Acts that's new here. Let's, let's read it. Peter doubted in himself what the vision he had seen would mean. What, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius made inquiry in Simon's house and stood before the gate and called out loud and asked whether Simon, surnamed Peter, were lodged there. No secret about it. While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said to him, three men are looking for you. Again, the Spirit spoke. The devil can speak too now. He can speak. Uh, sometimes if you're not really spiritually discerning, you can have a problem. So be very careful about that. What did the Spirit say? Arise therefore and get down and, and go with them. Doubting nothing. Doubting nothing. With no misgivings. For I myself... Now, there's one way you can really be sure that you're listening to God. I, myself. Are you familiar with emphatic? I, myself, and no one else. I, myself, have sent them. It's not that that they've just happened along the way. I sent them. They're at the door. They're calling for you. So, Peter, he's giving Peter heads up. Something is about to happen here. You just trust me every step of the way, okay? I know this goes against the grain. I realize this does. Peter went down to the men which were sent to him from Cornelius 
and said, I am the one you're seeking. What is the cause from which you are come? And they said, here's, here's what their answer is. Cornelius, the centurion, the Roman centurion, the Gentile centurion, is a just man who worships or fears God and is of a good report among all the nation of the Jews. So he is of good report to them within and to them without. Okay, you see that? Cornelius had a good reputation among the Jews, which is in itself a tremendous statement there because he's a Roman centurion. Now remember, remember here, this, we're still in the transition phase here. Who was it that crucified Jesus? Who actually crucified Jesus? The Roman soldiers did that. Who spiritually crucified Jesus? All of us, but it was technically the Jewish people. Both of these people groups right here, Peter's dealing with. Okay, he says, the one that fears God have a good report of the nation of the Jews was warned of God by a holy angel to send for you into his house to hear a message from you. We want to hear what you got to say. Again, makes no sense at all if it stands alone, but it doesn't stand alone because it's going to be explained here. He had a good testimony among the Jews and the Gentiles. Now watch this. He called them in. Does everybody have that expression in whatever translation you have? Verse 23. He called them in. Uh, okay, invited, but the he, the pronoun he, that's what I'm... Does everybody have the word, he, the pronoun he? Some have said that this is Peter assuming the authority over Simon the Tanner's house, which could very well be. But it's, there's a little bit of a problem here in verse number 23. He called them in and lodged them, and on the morning, Peter. So it's, de it's definitely probably talking about two different people. Simon the Tanner has called them in and lodged them, let them come into his house and spend the night. Now what's involved in somebody coming in and spending the night? You going to feed them supper? What is involved in that, in that day? It's not just throw another tater on the fire. No, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. You've got all these people here that are out there. It's, it's, a, it's a really big deal. So they, they, they bring them in, they lodge them, and on the morning the next day, Peter went away with them, the three messengers, and certain brethren... I happen to know it was six of them because I read ahead. <laughs> if you read ahead, you'll know that there were six of them. Certain believers, certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. And on the morning after they came to Caesarea, tell me what you know about Caesarea. Caesarea. Vacation spot. Everybody lived in Caesarea. It's the Daytona Beach, the Myrtle Beach of the, of the Jewish nation. Everybody wanted to live in Caesarea. They entered into Caesarea. They comes into Caesarea, and Cornelius was waiting for him. The Roman soldier is waiting for them. He called together his kinsmen and near friends. He got a bunch of people coming in. They're going to see what this, pre this Jewish preacher's got to say. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshiped him. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? What did Peter do? Don't turn the page. He's, what did he do? Don't do that. Don't do that. I'm going to turn the page. Peter took him up saying, stand up. Don't do that. I, myself, am also a man. Quite frankly, guys, girls, ladies, gentlemen, that's why I do not carry the title of reverend. I, I, I just don't think any man deserves the title of reverend. There's only one, and that's Jesus. You call me Tom, you can call me Pastor, or Brother Tom, whatever you want to call me, but uh, I, I don't think anybody deserves the title of being reverend. There's only one, that's Jesus Christ. I'm just a man. I'm just a man. The reverse of this from Peter can be seen at the transfiguration. What did Peter say 
on the mountain of transfiguration. When Moses and Elijah and Jesus were transfigured in front of them, what did Peter say? Hey, it's good to us to be here. He, he liked it. He wanted to be there. Here he says, listen, I'm just a man. Uh-uh, there's nothing special about me. I'm just a man. That's the reverse. Peter has grown a lot. Peter's come a long way here. I still say I'd like to live next door to him. Wouldn't that be a hoot in heaven? <laughs> Talk to Peter across the back fence there. As he talked with him, he went in and he found a bunch of people inside the house all waiting on Peter. They are assembled, assembled in there, verse 27. And he says unto them, you know how it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company to associate or to be associated with or come into one from another nation. But God has showed me something here that I should not call any man common. Common, verse 28. Anybody got another word for the word common? Unclean. Unclean. Anything else? Unholy, common, or unclean. Don't call any man common. He has shown me that I should not do that. All right, he's beginning to understand. Voila, that's what the sheep meant. That's what the sheep was all about. God has showed me a lesson. Peter's a little bit thick, but he gets this. He gets it real clear, okay? He says, that's, that's what that meant. That's exactly what that meant, those unclean animals and so forth. Therefore, he says, I came to you without gainsaying. Another word, anybody? 29? Gainsaying. I came to you without gainsaying. Without objection, without hesitation. As soon as I was sent for. He doesn't intrude into it. He's waiting to have an invitation. So I'm asking, what is the reason that you sent for me? Now Peter explains something here that possibly we need to understand. Jesus himself, and this, you're going, I don't want you to get the wrong idea about this, but Jesus was a Jewish man who kept the law. He observed the law. He went to the tabernacle, went to the temple. Uh, I have a problem with him offering a sacrifice to a priest. I have a problem with that. I don't know how that worked. Has anybody, Jordan, you ever studied that out as to what he, Huh? do that. I'm, I'm, I have a little problem with Jesus bringing a sacrifice to the priest to offer it. I just have a problem with that. But I know he fulfilled the law. He kept the law. Anybody got any thoughts about that? Did, did he go, sir? Right. Right. And that's right. Well, like Ronnie said, that's why he said, baptize me. You must baptize me before I can get started. Go, Frank. Fulfill, fulfill the law. So he kept, he kept every bit of the law. I, I'm just, I believe that with all my heart. I really do. An example. He's showing what the law is all about. He's going to present himself as the Lamb of God. John's already presented him as the Lamb of God three years back of that. But um, that's, that is a, that's an amazing thing. He, he humiliated himself and he humbled himself to become the sacrifice. He had to do that. And in the sense of doing that, he never sinned, not one time. That's exactly right. Since he was the sacrifice, that clearly shows us what that sacrifice is all about. The Jewish people will in the temple area, but he's there. He, he, is, he, is, he is there. 
See, Jesus broke the tradition when he said, I must go through Samaria. Lord, you can't do that. Yeah, I have to go through Samaria. He, he knew he was going to be looked down upon by doing what he did here. But he went to Samaria and saw the woman at the well, won her. She went and got all the people in the, the whole town, the whole town, and brought them out. But there's still this taboo. There's still this, this idea of people of other nations. Uh, can I associate with them? We're going to see it again. It's going to come up a time, several times here. And Peter's going to have to deal with it because he... It's still that way today. I'm sorry? It's still that way today. Really? Watch the news. Well, okay. It's a, different, it's a different faith, a different religion. That's true. That's right. Uh, but just think about that. He says, he, I can no longer look at another man as ceremonially unclean and unfit. I can't do that. Peter is talking about, now this is Peter. This is the one who took the lead in everything, all things apostleship, all things. Peter's always doing in the, taking the lead here. Now, Cornelius starts giving his testimony. Verse number 30. Four days ago, I was fasting until this hour. And during the ninth hour, ninth hour, what time of the day is that? During the ninth hour would be from three to four in that period of time. At the time of afternoon prayer, I was praying in my house. He is observing the Jewish afternoon time of prayer. He's observing that. I was praying, and behold, there stood a man before me in brilliant, white, shining clothing. Now, who this is? It's either Jesus or deity in some form, isn't it? An angel of the Lord or something. He says in verse 31, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard. Your alms have been received in remembrance of the sight of God. Does God remember our little things that we do? Every little cup of cold water? You say that don't mean, that don't amount to a hill of beans. It really does. It really does. It, it, whatever part you can play, God remembers. God writes it down, shall we say. Does it do anything to get you into heaven? But what does it do to be rewarded for your work that you do for God? I'm sorry? Strengthens and encourages. Strengthens and encourage. glorifies. glorifies God. There is a reward for good works. Not that you're going to be rewarded by getting to go to heaven. I've, like I told you about my man down at Wartburg, he says, I'm afraid not to come to church because I don't want to go to hell. Uh, it, took a, it took a little while to help him get straightened out with that because that's, that's, not, that's not the plan of God. God doesn't just thunder down all this kind of stuff. But there is, a, there is a way that we can be rewarded at the judgment seat of Christ for things that we do that are right motives. Four days ago, I was praying, he said, about 3 to 4 p.m., and a man stood before me in brilliant white shining clothing saying, your prayers have been heard and your alms have been remembered. God remembers everything. So send to Joppa, verse 32, and call hither a person whose name is Simon Peter. He is lodged in the house. Now this is just, is just repetition here. Let's just read it with comments as we go. He is lodged in the house of one Simon a tanner by the seaside, who when he comes, he shall speak to you. He'll give you a message. Immediately, therefore, I sent for you, and you have done well in coming. This is Cornelius speaking. Now, therefore, we're all present before God to hear the message. We want to hear what you've got to say. You've obviously got something that God wants us to hear from you, so let's go. Let's, let's call the service to order here and somebody sing Amazing Grace and let's let the man preach. Let's, let's find out what he's got to do here. Okay? Any thoughts or comments about that thus far? All right. Now, we're not quite through yet. We're not quite through. Peter's sermon at the house of Cornelius. 
This is a rather long passage. Let me just read it here. And this is, this is just clearly reiterating what we just got through saying. Peter opened his mouth and said, I perceive, I most certainly understand now that God is no respecter of persons. He clearly understood the vision sheet, the sheet, the vision of the sheet. He clearly understood that, realizing that these are people groups he's talking about, and God shows no partiality to any one group of people or any person who fears God and does right and is accepted by Him. This is a great lesson. This is a real lesson for every, all of us to learn. In every nation, verse 35, no exceptions, every nation, there are people who respect, fear, respect, and worship God and work righteousness. And it's accepted with Him in every nation. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus the Christ. Here we go. He's bringing, he's bringing Christ into it. Now, he's not going to talk too long without bringing in the Lord, okay? He is Lord of all. God sent his word out to the Jew first, and Jesus is indeed Lord of all men. That word, I say, you know, which was published in out all of Judea, and began from Galilee after the baptism of which John was talking. That's the baptism that he gave to Jesus. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit. Now watch it. Was he always God? Then what's this business of being anointed with the Holy Spirit? I'm sorry? For the work... It's a symbol. It's a sign. His work, his, his ministry is starting. Did he have a ministry before that? We don't know. We don't know. We, we know him at birth. We know him at eight days when he was circumcised. We know him at 40 days when he was presented in the temple. We know him at the age of 12 when he was bar mitzvahed. The rest of it, we don't know. I assume, I assume he had a ministry. But something happened in that period of time his stepfather Joseph had to have died. Apparently he became the head of the family. It was probably his family that had the wedding in Cana and he's the oldest, the oldest son in the family so he's, he becomes the patriarch of the family. We don't know a lot of things that went on like that but he says that this, he was going on there. Peter is briefly recapping what Jesus is all about. We are witnesses. Verse 39 of all the things that he did in the land of the Jews. We, we, who we? We, we who? Peter, the apostles, we are witnesses that he did, the things that he did, whom they, the Jews, slew, killed, and hung on a tree. That's the one, verse 40, that God raised up the third day and showed him openly. What's the significance of that? Showed him openly openly after Jesus was resurrected he was shown publicly by 518 or 500, 518 and 19 witnesses that he is in fact alive shown him publicly openly not to all the people but unto the witnesses chosen before of God to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. Now, notice he doesn't say anything at all about what the death meant. He's not talking about that. He doesn't deal with a lot of things. He's just presenting the facts. Jesus came. They hung him on a cross. They killed him. God raised him back from the dead. That's the, that's the, important, that's the important thing. But it was witnessed by a limited number of people, specially chosen by God. Verse 42 and he commanded us to preach. Preach to the people. Testify it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. Quick. Quick means what? The living. The living and the dead. You cut yourself to the quick means you cut yourself to the living tissue. The quick and the dead. The living and the dead. To him all the prophets give witness that through his name, here's his invitation, through his name, who's his? His name is Jesus, right? Through his name, whatsoever, whosoever believes in him should receive the remission of sins. 
through His name, in His name. Another verse of Scripture you can use is, There is none other name given among men whereby men must be saved than the name of Christ Jesus. What does it mean to be in His name? What does that mean? We pray in Jesus' name. What does that mean? Okay. When we pray in Jesus' name, is that just something we tack on the end of our prayer? What does that mean? This I pray in Jesus' name. Okay, so what does that mean? Next. Pray to God through Jesus. So when you're praying, you pray to God, but in the name of Jesus, because He is the one that we have to go through to get to God. Okay, so does that mean that we're going through Him? A mediator? We pray in His name. He clearly says right here. Receive through His name. The name of Jesus means what? Yeshua means what? His name shall be called Yeshua because what? He shall save His people from their sins. Yeshua, we translate that by Jesus. Jesus in the, in the Latin and Spanish, I guess. But His name shall be called Jesus, Yeshua. For his, by the way, that's the same word that is translated Joshua in the Old Testament as well. Jesus, Joshua, don't mean this like it may sound, but it's just a common name. It was just a common name. It means Jehovah saves. You shall receive remission of sins. Okay, I'm a Jewish man. How have I received remission of sins before now? And what does that do? How do I go about doing that? If it's a sin offering, there's certain ways you have to go about it. There are drink offerings, there are wave offerings, there are all kinds of offerings, trespass offerings, sin offerings, Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving offerings, offerings, right? I, I can be forgiven, I can have remission of sin. Remission means what? Remission. It's right, it's right on the tip of your tongue. Remission. If a person has cancer and is in remission, what does that mean? I'm sorry? Gone away for, for a season? Something along that line? Remission? You've, you've gone into, it, it's no longer affecting you right now in remission, whatever. Remission. You can receive remission of sins. How, how, how did they do that? They came to the temple, they presented a, sac a sacrifice, and the sacrifice was offered by the priest or the Levite or whatever, whoever happened to be. And if God accepted your sacrifice, He accepted you. All right. Our sacrifice is who? Jesus, Jesus Christ. Did God accept His sacrifice? How do you know? Is that good enough? It's yes. <laughs> good enough for you, isn't it, Denise? Because he came back from among the dead ones. The other sacrifices never did come back. Okay? He came back from among the dead ones. Now watch what happens. Verse 44, While Peter spoke these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all of them which heard the word. Okay? So you think this is the moment of their salvation? He, he fell on them which heard the word. Obviously, is there any part they have to do? If the Holy Spirit entered them, they were Well, they, that's true because without Him you're not saved. But what does it mean to hear the word? Many people hear my voice right now. Okay, then what you're, I'm sorry. All right, on the, on the road to Damascus, Paul is on his way to kill Christians. He's been killing Christians. He's got a bunch of strokes on his, on his belt of Christians that he has killed. He's voted down every time, every time he voted death. Every time he got a vote in the Sanhedrin, he voted. The Bible says that he was knocked to his face and a voice 
from heaven said, spoke to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Paul, Saul, said, who art thou, Lord? And he says, I am, anybody? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Was Saul persecuting Jesus? I mean, physically? No. But Jesus said, you're persecuting me when you lay hands on one of my people. All right, now he says, it's hard for you to kick against the bricks and so forth, you know, things along this line here. But think about this. He says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. The men who were with him heard the sound of a voice, but did not hear the conversation. Have you ever heard the sound of a voice without clearly hearing what was said? I do it all the time. If I don't have captions on, a lot of times I can't understand what the TV things are saying, especially some of these old movies where they talk so fast. Uh, But can you hear the sound without hearing exactly what was said? They heard the sound of something going on, but they did not hear. Paul clearly heard it. That's the difference in what happened right here. They clearly got it. They Not hear, but hear. They got it. They understood. They got it. It's like Claire says, they had to believe. They had to accept and to believe. And so the Spirit fell on them which heard. They heard it. I got it. Uh, One time when you're talking to somebody about the Lord and you've brought them up to the time that they're asking God to save them, they're praying, God save me, peek at them, watch them. You can see it happen. You can see the light bulb come on. You can see it happen when they really do see it. I've used this illustration time and time and time again. Seventh grade, Ms. Wade Butcher was teaching us about a direct object. And she was trying to explain to us seventh graders what is a direct object. The direct object of a sentence. A subject, the verb, the direct object, the predicate, nominative, and all that. Kind. What is a direct object? It says it receives the action of the verb. Okay, I got that, but I don't got that. What does that mean? It receives the action of the verb. The direct object receives the action of the verb. She said it several times. Miss, Miss Butcher had a very distinctive voice like Miss Beth Runyon. She had a very distinctive, clear voice. It, you receive the action of the verb. And I looked there, and she probably thought, Tommy, Tommy hadn't got it yet. So she said, if I hit you, you receive the action. I got it. The light went on. You receive the action of the verb. So I heard it. I got it. The light bulb went off. The mom and dad and Miss Butcher went to the same church, and they were talking the following Sunday. And she (laughs) she said, I could see it. I saw it when he got it. I saw the light go on when he got that. I had, they'd been telling me that from, since the third and fourth grade, I guess, but I just didn't get it until I got it. So sometimes we get it. Sometimes we really see what God is doing for us. And he says, when Peter spoke this, these people that really heard it, really heard it, they received it. Any thoughts or comments about this thus far? Anything? All right, let's go one more, go one more verse or two here. Verse number 45. I want to finish. I will not be with here next Wednesday. And so, uh, but I'll be, we'll just be, well, I'll tell you what, let's go on to verse number 48. They of the circumcision, who is that? They of the circumcision, the Jewish believers who had accompanied Peter, which believed were astonished. Astonished at what? Some of these people that have accompanied Peter, six of them, are not as far along as Peter is. They didn't get to see the sheet. They're astonished at what? They were astonished. At what? They were astonished at Peter and his reception of the Gentiles. And their reception of the gospel. Duh! That's not supposed to happen. See, they're not as far along as Peter is. They're going to get an eye-opening expression too here. 
as many as came with Peter, because on the Gentiles had been poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. They were Christian, but they had baggage. They still had some, they still had some hang-ups. They still had some problems here. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. They heard what they were saying. Now here is a gift of tongues that, that proves that this people group has in fact received the Holy Spirit of God. On the Pentecost, there were languages. Here it just simply says they, were, they spoke with tongues. They're praising God. And they magnified God. The gift of tongues was given to them. So there's no doubt, there's no doubt that they should, they should get this, get this, you ought to get this now. Uh, they clearly get this understand. Can any man, Peter said, forbid water that these should be baptized? They have received the Spirit as well as we have. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. And they said, stay with us. Stay with us a few days. Stay with us. Don't go. Don't leave us. Peter recognized that these people should be brought into the church membership, the church fellowship, and baptism quickly followed. Peter didn't go back to Jerusalem quickly. He remained there to give instruction in the Christian life, no doubt. But these people have received Christ, they have received the Lord, and they are being baptized. By the way, where would they be baptized at Caesarea? In the Mediterranean Sea, probably. <laughs> it is the Daytona Beach. It is the Myrtle Beach of the area right there. And so they're probably baptized right out there, wide open, wide open spaces right there. Any thoughts or comments? We're going to stop right there because there is a couple of other things that we need to talk about. Uh, Peter's going to account for this once again. He's going to read. I want you to read chapter number 11. It's just a repeat of what that's all about. And he repeats it that he's going on. And then uh, basically chapter 11 just repeats what has happened right there. That's probably as far as we'll go in our study of Peter. And I don't know where we're going from here. If there's any questions or comments about where you want to go, that's fine with me, but uh, on Wednesday nights. Any thoughts or comments? Are we going to meet next Wednesday night? Michael, I haven't talked to Michael yet, but he's, he's on board to, to be here. I haven't talked to him. He don't know it yet, but he will. <laughs> he does now. Yeah. He's going he, to teach Bill's class. On, I, would, I normally would. I'd said, well, that's no problem. I'll take it. No, I can't take care of it. I won't be here. So, uh, so anyhow, Bill, he, he will take Bill's class in the gym. In the gym. Anything else? I'll be, uh, surgery is Wednesday. I'll be probably out of there by Thursday, Friday. And I probably will be, <laughs> I'll probably be out, but I don't know how much I'll be out and about. I will be uh, quarantined, sequestered after the COVID test on Friday. I won't be able to get out uh, to go to be around anybody until the surgery, just, just, to, just because that's the way it is. But I'll be watching you. I'll be listening. I'll be looking over your shoulder. So next go. Wednesday you're having surgery? Next surgery. The surgery is Wednesday, yeah. By the way, I've passed my test with my heart doctor. I passed the test with my medical doctor. I passed the test with my brain doctor. I've got proof I've got a brain. You got, you got proof you've got a brain? Has anybody got proof? I do. <laughs> and also, there's another doctor that agreed with me too. He said, well, you, you can do it. I was hoping they would all say, you can't do it. <laughs> but that's supposed to go, Frank. Uh, I'm sure they did. That, that is in chapter number 11. By the way, that's where it says that there were six of them. That's where I got that from, that there were six of them. I, I've been reading ahead. So chapter 11, we'll, we'll be talking about that as well. Okay? Uh, so I will not be here with you on su uh, Sunday. Because of that, I won't be able to get out. If everything goes well, they don't put it off again. Okay? All right, anything else before we go? I appreciate your prayers for me. I appreciate your prayers for Bill. He, did, he came out through the surgery just fine. Uh, they did stents in the, in the kidney uh, ducts and so forth, and uh, he was in quite a bit of pain. And he's not through. They're not through with it, but they're going to have to do it again a little bit later on. But 
Uh, he's, he's there. Okay, is that it? Carolyn, would you lead us in prayer, please? That's right. Right. Bless you, folks.